Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Frankel, and on behalf of my co-authors, I'm going to present our proposal for using cryptography to enhance the accountability of electronic surveillance in the United States. So I want to start with a startling fact about government surveillance. Since 1979, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Court, or the FISA Court, has processed over 28,000 warrant applications and renewals. That's about 1,000 every single year. And as many of you know, the FISA Court conducts its business in secret, counter to the well-established principle of judicial openness. Unfortunately, I'm not actually going to talk about FISA today because there's an even bigger problem. There's another federal docket that handles tens of thousands of secret cases every year, most of which are warrants for what's called electronic surveillance, requesting emails or other digital records from service providers like Microsoft or Amazon. This is where we're going to focus our attention. So the quote you've just seen and the quotes you're about to see were written by Judge Stephen Smith, who's a federal magistrate judge in Houston who, as part of his job, issues these electronic surveillance orders. For reasons that I'll explain momentarily, nearly all of these orders remain permanently hidden from the public eye. Judge Smith has written two excellent accessible law review articles on the topic, which serve as the basis for much of this presentation and the inspiration for our technical work. So they're very much worth reading. Highly recommend it. So before we go any further, I want to discuss the electronic surveillance process and how it works. There's actually no official set of procedures, but this is generally the workflow under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or ECPA. So first, a law enforcement agency, like the FBI, determines that there's someone, a target, whom they wish to investigate. They then request that a judge issue a warrant authorizing them to obtain data about this person from the company. If the judge denies the request, that's the end of the process. But if the judge does issue a warrant, then the judge will provide the law enforcement agency with a court order authorizing it to collect data from the company. The law enforcement agency can then approach a company like Microsoft and request data about the target, like their email inbox. And finally, the company can choose to challenge this order with the judge, but if the order stands, then they have to hand over data to the law enforcement agency. So there's one catch, that this whole process has to take place in secret. So as Judge Smith explains, disclosure of a surveillance order during the course of a criminal investigation would be self-defeating, meaning that the target of the investigation could destroy evidence, flee, or otherwise interfere with the investigation. So temporary secrecy is vitally important. And there are two measures a court can use to ensure the secrecy. The first is that they can seal judicial records. This is highly unusual in our legal tradition. Judge Smith actually refers to a court's judicial openness as, quote, the source of its own legitimacy. However, while the seal is in place, the court can ensure that no member of the public, including the target, can find these records and learn about the proceedings. And now there's one other measure here, a gag order, which prevents companies from actually telling the target that any of this surveillance is taking place. Now, once the secrecy is no longer necessary, the gag and the seal can be removed and relevant court records made available to the public with traditional judicial transparency. And these tools are very important. Otherwise, a potential criminal might evade justice. But Judge Smith also points out three important accountability problems with our system. The first is that judges neglect sealed cases. All seals come with an expiration date, but judges usually forget to unseal cases even after the seals have expired. In practice, Judge F Smith found that nearly all sealed cases are, quote, effectively sealed in perpetuity. Not only is this an accountability problem, but individuals should be able to find out that their data was accessed once secrecy is no longer necessary. Second, in the, the American judicial system, the law gets interpreted when decisions by lower courts, like magistrate judges, are appealed to higher courts. But because of gags and seals, a target never finds out that they were being surveilled, and cases never get appealed, leaving magistrate judges with, again, quote, literally no appellate guidance. Okay, one last problem. Since so many of these cases are hidden from public view and spread across courthouses all over the country, Neither Congress nor the public can accurately assess the breadth and depth of current electronic surveillance activity. We have very little idea how many of these orders are being issued, why, by whom, and, a, and about which kinds of data. And these, again, are all quotes from Judge Smith. So here's Judge Smith's proposal. He thinks that we should have a cover sheet accompanying each order. Whenever a judge issues an order, they would fill out this cover sheet with metadata about the case, like the kind of crime for which the order was issued, the kind of data being searched, and when the seal expires. These cover sheets would always be public, even when the case is sealed, providing a visible marker for these otherwise hidden cases. But there's a tension here. The more information Judge Smith releases, the better the accountability, but the more he releases, the more likely it is the target will find out. So there's a trade-off between secrecy and accountability, and the only choice Judge Smith has to make is the amount of information to release. So this is where we come in. Our contribution is to demonstrate the accountability achievable when modern cryptography is brought to bear. 
Judge Smith had the option of either writing information down on paper or omitting it. And we're going to show how off-the-shelf cryptographic primitives like zero knowledge, cryptographic commitments, and multi-party computation creates a much larger design space for showing that surveillance is being conducted properly without revealing information that could put investigations at risk. So we have one high-level policy goal here, which is accountability. So what does accountability actually mean in this context? First, we want to demonstrate that each participant, that means judges, law enforcement agencies, and companies, performs its role properly and lawfully. And second, we want to ensure that the public is aware of the extent of government surveillance. So let's get into our threat model very briefly, and then we can get to the technical details. As we discussed earlier, even though we trust judges to perform their jobs in good faith, they may be forgetful, especially about SEALs. And we have demonstrable evidence that this has happened. And when it comes to law enforcement agencies, they may try to get more data than was authorized, or they may fake a court order completely. And there are recorded cases where this has happened. Companies may try to give data without the public knowing, or they may even give data without a court order. And finally, the public may be malicious. And by that we mean the public may include criminals who are trying to learn that they're being investigated. Okay, so let's get into the technical details. First, I'm going to walk you through our system at a high level. The general conceit is that at each step of the surveillance process, a piece of accountability-enhancing information is posted to a publicly visible ledger. So this is our ledger. It's, you, the arrow represents time moving forward. So the ledger itself needs to be tamper-resistant, append-only, and limited to a specific group of contributors. And this ledger could be implemented in a number of ways, including a central database or a distributed system. So on the bottom, I'm going to reproduce the diagram from earlier about the surveillance process. So first, the law enforcement agency requests a warrant. And in response, the judge issues a court order, just like before. But in addition, the judge posts two items to the ledger. First, the judge posts metadata about the case in plain text. And at the very least, this should be the date at which the seal expires, but it could include other information from Judge Smith's proposed cover sheets. And finally, the judge posts a cryptographic commitment of the court order. And as a reminder, a commitment is a string that reveals nothing about the order. But when the, when the order is revealed, the public can verify that the order that was revealed is the same one that was committed. So we get a little bit of accountability while maintaining secrecy. Now next, the law enforcement agency issues a data request to the company, and simultaneously it also posts a commitment to the contents of this data request, getting us the same properties as before. But in addition, it can post something else, a zero-knowledge argument, which I'm representing with this little dashed arrow. So the zero-knowledge argument aims to relate the, data re the commitment of the data request to the commitment of the court order that authorizes it. So to review, a zero-knowledge argument is a string that convinces a verifier, like the public, of a fact without revealing any other information about that fact. So here, the argument is that the committed data request is related to the committed court order. It assures the public that the data request was in line with the data that was authorized without revealing any other details about either the data or the order, achieving accountability and secrecy. So the company does similarly when it issues its data response. It posts a commitment to the data it revealed, and it could also post a zero-knowledge argument that the data was related to both the court order and the data request. Now, finally, there's one more step. The law enforcement agency posts a commitment acknowledging this data response and an argument that this acknowledgement corresponds to both the data response and the court order. And we'll get into why this acknowledgement is very important in just a moment. So I want to go through a few scenarios to try to help us understand what exactly the system is doing. So first of all, as we said in our threat model, judges are honest, meaning the commitment to the court order will actually be posted correctly. Now, suppose something goes wrong. Suppose the agency requests data that isn't in the scope of the court order, say about a different person than the actual target, or more people than the actual target. If the zero knowledge argument is checking that the user IDs match between the court order and the data request, then the agency couldn't post a valid zero knowledge argument, and the public would notice that something went wrong. Now suppose the agency simply doesn't post a commitment or requests data about a different person than it actually committed to. No company could post a valid argument. So either way, the public finds out that something went wrong without knowing anything about the details. And now we can do the same exercise for the company. If it reveals data about a different user than it should, it won't be able to post a valid argument. And if it fails to post a commitment or reveals data about the wrong users, then that's where the acknowledgement comes into play. The acknowledgement couldn't contain a valid argument. So either way, the public finds out that something was amiss. And we get all this accountability without revealing anything specific about the surveillance itself. So the one case that the system can't handle is collusion between companies and law enforcement agencies, in which case they could just post nothing here. And so the only, the only thing we can do to deal with this is defer to the legal system. When this data is actually used as evidence in court, the judge should check to make sure the appropriate metadata to collect that data was posted. Okay, so this satisfies our first accountability goal. Now for our second goal, revealing the extent of surveillance, we need to rely on secure multi-party computation. So before going any further, I want to talk specifically about what that really means. So right now, most publicly available information about the extent of surveillance comes in the form of transparency reports issued voluntarily by major tech companies. 
These reports are generally issued every six months and answer vague questions like the total number of requests issued and the total number of user accounts implicated. So there are a couple of accountability problems with these reports. First, they're voluntary. We only have data from a few large companies, and those companies could stop releasing this data tomorrow if they so chose. Second, they're piecemeal and very difficult to compare data across companies. Third, they're exceedingly vague, and this is understandable. Companies are under gag orders, so they're conservative about what they choose to reveal. And finally, companies may have incentive to downplay the amount of surveillance on their platforms, so it would be valuable to have this information from other sources. So we could solve all of these problems if the court system would create its own system for publicly releasing these statistics. But this isn't anywhere near as easy as it sounds. First of all, courts are very risk averse when it comes to protecting their sensitive data. And often, they're not legally allowed to share their internal records with anyone else, making it very difficult for the court system to collect statistics. So to address this problem, we turn to secure multi-party computation, or MPC. So I want to do a quick refresher on MPC to contextualize what we're going to show. So it allows a series of entities, like a group of courts, to compute a function of their collectively held data without revealing any information to each other. So this is done through communication between the parties. This bubble here represents kind of a functional representation of this communication between the parties. MPC is not a separate entity. So we refer to this process as flat MPC for a reason that will become apparent in just a moment. And at this point, there are a number of fairly fast off-the-shelf MPC libraries, but our problem has some special features that make it a little bit more complicated. First, most general purpose MPC requires all participants to be online simultaneously. And this is a very tall order for 900 federal judges who are a little bit technophobic. And if one judge goes offline, this entire process grinds to a halt. Now second, MPC protocols don't scale particularly well to 900 participants. There are protocols for adding numbers together amongst many parties that scale linearly, but general purpose MPC tends to have about an N squared order of growth, and that's not very pretty for 900 parties. So we designed a way to solve these problems that takes advantage of the hierarchy of the American court system. Magistrate judges, these lower court judges like Judge Smith, report to one of 12 circuit courts of appeals, who themselves report to the Supreme Court. So here's our system. Rather than having the lower courts compute the MPC, they delegate that work to the circuit courts. And we refer to this as hierarchical MPC. So let me break this down. It starts by each lower court taking its data and breaking it up into 12 secret shares. And it sends one of these secret shares to each of the circuit courts. So none of the circuit courts have enough information to actually see any specific data. They simply have a share. Now, notice that this process can take place in an asynchronous fashion as the lower courts come and go offline. The circuit courts then perform an MPC to compute the final result. The MPC function involves computing these secret shares, or put, taking these secret shares and putting them back together, and then performing computation with them. So just to review, this satisfies our accountability goal of telling the public about the extent of surveillance, but it does so such that no court has to reveal its data to any other court, let alone to the public. And combined with our ledger that has commitments and zero knowledge arguments, we developed a way to assure the public that surveillance was being conducted properly without revealing specific information about surveillance itself. So we're done, right? Okay, so there's a word missing there, the whole practical part. So I want to get into some actual numbers here. So we tested two different kinds of MPC queries, and we used a library called GIF which implements MPC in JavaScript. Now, we chose JavaScript because we'd eventually like to integrate this into a web interface, which would make it much easier for courts to actually use the system in practice. So the first computation we tried was additive MPC, for example, computing how many court orders related to theft across the entire court system. So unsurprisingly, using flat MPC across all judges has an N squared order of growth. And the addition takes about seven minutes for 300 judges. Now, meanwhile, the hierarchical MPC, which involves combining the secret shares and then adding them together across 12 parties, scales linearly and completes much faster. It can handle the entire court system, that is, about 1,000 judges, in 20 seconds. Notice these scales are very different between the graphs. So we also tried a more sophisticated computation, thresholding, which involves computing the number of parties whose inputs exceed a certain value. For example, the number of, courts, the number of judges who issued more than 10 requests to Microsoft in a given time period. Thresholding reveals the distribution of surveillance, something not currently covered by transparency reports. So we see a similar pattern emerge. The flat protocol scales poorly as expected, requiring 20 minutes for just 35 lower court judges. Meanwhile, our hierarchical protocol scales approximately linearly. And again, notice these graphs are on very different scales. For about 400 um, judges, it takes about 3,000 seconds. So admittedly, this is still rather slow, and we'd like it to be a little bit faster. But we anticipate continued improvement in GIF, which was still in development when we used it for this paper, and in other MPC libraries will improve these numbers significantly. So what about zero knowledge? 
So we implemented some basic snarks, which are succinct, non-interactive arguments of knowledge. And we used an open source C++ framework called libsnark. Now, all snarks involve a four-step process. So first, we design a circuit about the statement that we want to prove. And second, we generate a proving key and verification key for that circuit. Both of these keys are public parameters. They're shared amongst all the participants. You use the proving key to generate an argument, and you use the verification key to then verify that argument. And these keys are shared amongst everyone who wants to prove or verify. And finally, the prover uses a proving key to generate an argument using some secretly known data, and a verifier uses a verification key to verify it using publicly known data. So all of our benchmark snarks looked at proving that two randomized commitments were commitments to the same value. For example, this could be that a judge might authorize a warrant for a particular email address, and law enforcement agencies should prove that the data it requested was for that same email address, an argument of equality. So we looked at three specific forms of snarks. The first was an argument of knowledge about the commitment contents, an argument that the prover, like the judge, actually knows the message that was committed to. The second was an argument of equality, that the two commitments actually contain the same message. And finally, we benchmarked what we call an existential argument of equality. So here's the idea. The court system may be uncomfortable with tying a specific data request to a specific court order. That may reveal too much information. Instead, what we want to show is that a, the data request corresponded to some court order amongst a pool of 100, 400, 700, or 1,000 court orders. So, so that requires a more complicated argument. So when working with snarks, there are actually a few different metrics that we want to get into. So the first is the... The first is the actual size of the argument itself, which is about 287 bytes, hence the word succinct. And the next is the size of the verification key, which is proportional to the size of the circuit. For our purposes, it tended to be in the single digit megabytes, which is a relatively reasonable size for someone in the public who wants to audit this. So now I want to talk about key generation time, the amount of time it takes to actually generate the keys, which is a non-trivial task. So let me walk you through this graph. The x-axis is the size of the message, the size of the email address in terms of bytes. And the y-axis is the amount of time it actually took to generate these arguments. So the lines here are for our different kinds of arguments. The bottom line is the argument of knowledge. The next line up is the argument of equality. And the upper lines are these existential arguments of equality for larger and larger pools of messages, 100 all the way up to 1,000. So key generation, which is a one-time operation for just a general class of statements that is to be proven, is relatively fast. It requires only a few minutes. So now what about the size of the proving keys? These get rather large, up to several hundred megabytes. Thankfully, these keys only need to be downloaded once, and they only need to be held by authorities that are generating proofs, not by the general public who would be verifying these proofs. And finally, what about the time to generate an argument? It took between a few seconds and about two minutes, depending on the size of the message. And that's very reasonable, considering the court proceedings leading to these arguments would take hours. And then verifying the actual argument itself takes tens or hundreds of milliseconds, which is perfectly reasonable for the public to get involved in this process. Now, admittedly, we're discussing very simple arguments, arguments that two strings are equal, and some variance on that. But thankfully, zero-knowledge implementations have moved very fast. The library we use for this is already out of date six months later, and so every time these protocols get faster, our system gets faster and more capable. We can prove more sophisticated arguments. So now I feel comfortable actually putting the word practical back in there. So the last thing I want to talk about very briefly is that although our chosen application is electronic surveillance, the system we designed is much more widely applicable to a broad class of problems we refer to as secret information processes. These are any process where a bunch of independent institutions need to act in a coordinated but secret fashion and at the same time are subject to public scrutiny. So this could involve other kinds of surveillance, like the FISA surveillance I talked about at the beginning, government spending on classified projects, and even clinical trials for new drugs. So to wrap up, I want to end where we started, with Judge Smith. So he's a lawyer, so I think his thoughts on our system sum things up much better than I possibly could. So Judge Smith said that his hope is that court administrators will embrace the possibility of enhancing a public oversight while preserving necessary secrecy. Lessons learned here will smooth the way towards greater accountability for a broader class of secret information processes, which are a hallmark of our digital age. So with that, thank you for listening. I'll take any questions. I have a question while everybody else is thinking. In the, at the very beginning when you're setting up the trust assumptions, mm -hmm. you set up the assumption that the judge is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. right? And the judge makes a commitment, and then everything else kind of follows from that. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what about enhancing... Did you think about enhancing the scheme with some proofs by the judge 
to the other participants, mm -hmm. that the thing that the judge has just committed to matches their understanding of what the court order says. So you're getting into two actually very deep issues that are challenges with this paper. The first is actually tying what goes on on this ledger to the real world. And that's a huge problem here. We, we can't guarantee that any real world actions correspond to anything on the ledger. And the other is getting into the understanding of what these actually mean. So one of the big challenges when dealing with these zero knowledge arguments is that what does it mean to actually demonstrate that thing A is, is compatible with thing B when it comes to a legal process? There's a whole larger body of work on actually mechanizing the law. So we started with things that were very simple, like comparing two email addresses to each other. But you could imagine a much broader set of processes. That might involve actually designing some sort of mechanical language that could allow the parties to, to write these mechanical proofs. So I think that's a much bigger question that is a little bit beyond the scope of this work, but is a huge issue when it comes to actually taking this work and putting it into practice, which we're now thinking about. Cool. More questions? Yeah. Hi. Noah Luther from Lincoln Laboratory. Uh, so my question is about the computations that you're doing in MPC. I was mm -hmm. wondering if there were any more complicated uh, like statistics that the companies are computing in their sort of transparency reports that are more complicated in an MPC context that you looked into and sort of how well those perform since you're doing like additions in additive that's not super complicated. So that's a fantastic question. The companies are posting very little. What I described, just the aggregate number of requests and the number of users implicated, is pretty much all the companies actually put out there. So this is the, this should trouble a lot of the people in this room that there's very little accountability over this process right now. So I, I think even by advocating for adding these threshold computations, we're actually pushing the envelope for the legal process right now. So I would say that it would be very exciting if we actually started looking at some more sophisticated statistics. The court system is exceedingly risk averse. It's hard to overstate how risk averse it is, but I think this would be exciting. And I know there's a lot of MPC work right now looking at statistics and machine learning. So it would be very interesting to try to scale that up to this. I think that would be a great research problem. Great, thanks. More questions? Hello. Um, could you go to the slide where you talk about splitting up the data and sending it to the lower, the courts? Let me move backwards a long way. Yeah, sorry. Okay, right here. There yeah. we go. I just had a question about this part. So are you sending the data from the um, original courts to the other courts in the um, directly every time, or are you putting it on like a stack and then having them um, query the, just query the stack when they need to access the data? Because it seems like if you're sending data from like core one to D circuit one and circuit one's offline, then that would cause some problems and you'd have a lot of branching going on. Could you uh, go into that? Definitely. So let me again shock you with something else about the legal system. These statistics are computed once every six months. Oh. <laughs> so the latency that we can tolerate is extreme. And so it would be great if we could compute this more often, but more often means once a month. So as long as the circuit courts here have a server that is online periodically, then, then this will all work. And again, it would be great to step this up to something that might get you something closer to real-time accountability, but then that starts to push on revealing too much information. But it's a great question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kizubi Sako from NAC. So just follow up on this slide. Mm -hmm. Who are, I, I missed your explanation. Who are these circuits? And what kind of trust do we have to put in them? So that, that's a great question. So the circuit, the way the American court system works is that there's a three-level hierarchy for the most part. There are these lower courts, which are the district courts or the magistrate judges, and then there are circuit courts of appeals, which hear decisions that are appealed from those district courts. Then at the top, we could imagine the Supreme Court, which hear, hears all the appeals. We don't really rely on the Supreme Court here. So these circuit courts, there are only 12 of them. This is kind of the next level up in the hierarchy. And so the trust assumptions we have in these courts, the, the only assumption we have is that since these courts have a one out of 12 secret share of each district court's data, that these courts don't get together and actually put these shares back together. That's our only real trust assumption. 